This show is so jam-packed. Jackson, we don't even have time for chit-chat right now. Sports scene starts now. Welcome to the luxurious Annenberg Media Center. I'm Jackson Safon. And I'm Max Goldwasser. The USC baseball team is set to face Loyola Marymount on Wednesday after an unexpected rough start to their season. That's right, Max. The Trojans went 1-2 in their opening series against the North Dakota Fighting Hawks. All three games were decided by one run, with the Trojans only able to pull out the win on Sunday. With the two losses, the Trojans fell nine spots to number 21 in the rankings. The bats were cold to start the year, and the players know that this is something that they need to improve on. I think we just got to work on being more aggressive, especially at the plate. We were too passive and letting that guy t take advantage of us instead of us taking advantage of him. This week, USC travels to LMU for just one game before coming home for a four-game stint. The Trojans faced Wake Forest coming up this weekend. Max, what does Wake Forest do well? Uh, if I could put it all on one person, I would, and that would be all down to Will Craig. And he's already batting this season, 500, to lead the team. He's got multiple home runs in just three games. And not only that, he's helped on the other side of the ball as a pitcher. He's got a save under his belt, so definitely a lot to look out for with Will Craig and the rest of this offense for this Wake Forest team. Yeah, Craig leads the team with two homers. He also leads the team by a large margin with eight RBIs. He's obviously really dynamic for their offense. Kevin Conroy as well at the top of their lineup. He's batting over 400 on the year. He's second on the team in total bases he's, and second on the team in hits. He's obviously been a dynamic presence at the top of the lineup. Wake Forest bullpen is obviously suspect, but they are 3-0, so you can't knock them too much. Last week, the sports scene team predicted the lineup for the Trojans, and while the infield is what we expected, there were some surprises in the outfield. The one big move is Timmy Robinson moving from center field to designated hitter. He started off the entirety of last season in center, but this year he moved to DH with freshman Lars Newpar taking over in center. Yeah, I, I would guess it's because they want Timmy to be fresher. His bat's really important to this team with losing a lot of guys from last year. But Newtbar's really played well so far this year in center. He's batting 375, leads the team in RBIs with three. Obviously, leading the team in RBIs with three isn't necessarily a good thing as the team needs more offensive output as a whole. But Newtbar's been a really pleasant surprise so far this season. No, he started off strong and kind of the other side. Timmy Robinson hasn't really exactly had the greatest start to any season of his career. But it's going to be nice for him that he got his first hit in walk-off fashion. It's going to be good for his confidence and for the team's confidence as a whole moving forward. Yeah, obviously Robinson got off to a slow start in the season. He's 1 for 11 with, you mentioned, the walk-off single on Sunday. But another guy who needs to show some improvement is Reggie Southall. He was starting shortstop for the team. Last year he batted eighth in the lineup. This year, bumped him up all the way to leadoff. Started 0 for 12, leads the team with six, six strikeouts. Obviously, that's not what you want from your leadoff hitter. Yeah, his bat's a little bit cold, and so were the rest of USC's bats. Except as the series progressed, their bats started to heat up a little bit. And let's see if that team can keep it going. Yeah, I mean, as we mentioned, the Trojans have a string of five games in six days starting tomorrow. After dropping the first series, they'll need to get some wins. Now, for some more on some other USC sports, let's toss it over to Rachel. Thanks, Jackson. It's time to take a look at the past week in USC sports. It's time to light the torch. The USC women's lacrosse team had a huge upset over number five Duke last Saturday, 11 to five. This game marks the first time the women of Troy have ever defeated a top 10 team. Junior attacker Kylie Drexel led the team with four goals and one assist. But while the win was obviously a big one, the team knows they need to continue to stay focused. We know that you know, we worked really, really hard preparing for this game and we gotta kind of keep that going in the future. Um, we have three really big games coming up, uh, all home games with Michigan, Vermont, um, and Stony Brook. So we really just gotta keep this going through the rest of the season. It means nothing to beat Duke if we don't beat these next couple teams. In their first game at the newly renovated Mark Stadium, the women's tennis team fell to first-ranked California 6-1. The only singles win of the day came from Juliana Olmos, who beat Cal's Megan Menasi 6-3. Olmos also brought in the only doubles win with her partner Gabby Smith. Smith previews the Trojans' next matchup at UCLA this Thursday. I'm really excited to go there and compete. Last year, um, when we went and played there, I didn't win, so I'm excited to go there and win this time so <laughs> the undefeated women's water polo team pulled in yet another victory over Cal State Northridge USC's Stephania Haralabitis led the team with four points while freshman Amanda Longin made 13 saves in the goal the Trojans are ranked first in the nation and hope for the same outcome when they take on Cal State Northridge again this Saturday to hear more from one of water polo's own let's toss it over to Max who's joined by a special guest in studio 
We now welcome in Stephania Harwilabidis, a junior on the top ranked USC women's water polo team. Stephania, thank you for joining us. Uh, let's talk about your team for a little bit. Coming off your seventh straight win to begin the season and to remain number one in the nation for women, women's water polo. Uh, and it's not like these wins have been by any real slight margin. You, you just beat CSUN, on another ranked team by a score of 15 to three. So what does that say for your team's confidence and for your own confidence to know that you can kind of dominate other respected programs? Well, okay, yes, we do have confidence, but it's nothing compared to higher ranked teams like Stanford, UCLA, and Cal. Yeah, we beat other teams 15 to three, but um, we have to have confidence in ourselves. And like, for example, we love each other so much that we are, are confident to trust in each other in defense in offense, we know that we're going to make, uh, we know what the other person is thinking so we don't make mistakes. Um, yeah. Offense. Offense is something you know a lot about. Uh, last year, you were second in the team in scoring with 64 goals as a sophomore. And this year, you've already started off on the right track, scoring multiple goals in every game. And you won MPSF Player of the Week honors last week. So why do you think you've been so successful on the offensive side of the ball to begin your career? It's not because of me, it's because of my teammates. They are the ones who create opportunities. For example, I play on the 4-6 side, and my teams on the other side will be running picks and working for me for me to have space to kick in and shoot. Yeah, okay, I have a good shot, but it, it wouldn't, I wouldn't have those opportunities if it wasn't for my teammates. Uh, and your next game is going to be against CSUN again. Uh, is the game plan for that game going to be different than the first time you played them, or are we going to see things change up a little bit? Um, the rotations are going to change, but uh, I feel that we're going to stick to our plan and do the exa exact same offensive sequences and defensive sequences. Uh, now, as a fellow twin, I want to know what it's like playing with a twin on your team. Well, uh, playing with a twin on my team, well, she is pretty much my life. Uh, yeah, I, I love her very much. We're together, not 24-7, but a lot of times together. And I feel that I know what she wants in the game. She knows what I want in the game. And playing on the different sides of the pool, we work really good together. It just It's great having her on my team. I play better with her on my team than not playing with, with her. Another person on your team that's very well respected as a former player is your head coach, Jovan Vavic. So what, it's, what is it like to play for him, who's such you know, a historically uh, good water polo player himself? He is one of the best coaches in the world. He, okay, he's a very hard coach where he will get on your butt and be hard on you. But um, I have, if you see my first game of the season, my freshman year, and now how I'm playing in the national team and playing at USC, you see the improvement because of him. He's an amazing coach, and I think that um, anybody coming to this program will become even a better player with him as a coach. Now, I read in your bio online that you were uh, thinking about you, one of your goals was to try out for the Olympics and to make the Olympic team. Is that still a goal of yours? Have you started the training for that at all? Um, we, the thing is, I decided to come here and play for USC, and, it's, and I really want to win a national championship. So my, uh, my number one goal right now is NC2As, and then Olympics will come after that. Uh, last question. What is the biggest difference between Greece and the United States? Uh, Greece, better food, uh, less stress. <laughs> That's it. Those sound like pretty good things to me. All right, thank you, Stephanie, for joining us so much. And uh, now we're going to good luck in your next match also against CSUN on Saturday. Now we are going to toss it over to Rachel Cohn, who has our basketball update. USC basketball is headed into the home stretch of their season, looking to pick up momentum and finish strong. They're aiming to make a postseason run. Here's how they're trying to get there. The Trojans lost their first game at home this season on Sunday to Utah. They're 15 and one in the Galen Center, improving on their eight and eight record from last season. Everything about this season has been different from the last. With four games left, USC has a chance to finish the regular season in the top four of the Pac-12. That could prove to be a tall task for the team that excels at home, not away. USC is 3-5 and five on the road, and they head up to the Bay to take on Stanford and Cal this weekend. Right now, the Trojans sit in fifth place in the Pac-12, looking for that fourth seed. Why is the fourth seed so important? 
The top four teams in the Pac-12 get a first-round bye in the conference tournament in Las Vegas in March. The team that wins the Pac-12 tournament gets an automatic bid to March Madness. Of course, the NCAA tournament is the goal, but this season has already been a successful one for USC. Twice this season, the Trojans have been ranked in the AP Top 25. Before this season, the Trojans had not been ranked since 2008. In Joe Lenardi's latest bracketology projections, the Trojans dropped to an 8 seed after being as high as a 5 seed this year. USC is 1-3 in, in their last four games and needs to win this weekend to reverse that trend and avoid being on the bubble. So far this season, the Trojans have been exceeding expectations. We'll see if they can keep that going as they make the final push to the postseason. USC lost its first game at home on Sunday, and you could say only one man was to blame. The Trojans had no real answer for Utah big man Jakob Pertl. I'm now joined by Paolo Ugetti to help break down how Pirtle was so effective against USC. Thanks for joining me, Paolo. Thanks for having me. First, let's break down how USC's defense as a whole has struggled as of late. The Trojans are 1-3 over the last four games, and defense has really been the reason why. Yeah, as you can see the last four games, teams have really kind of scouted the Trojans. They're finding out what their weaknesses are. And on defense, there's been a couple things here and there that are really setting them back. Most importantly, and probably the biggest one, has been the rebounding margin. Trojans don't really have a consistent big man who can rebound the ball. They have a trio of guys who you know, are athletic and they, they, they are a big presence in the paint, but they're not really playing to their full potential right now. So it's really hurting them in the rebounding margin, and that leads to you know, teams getting second-chance points and really being more efficient when USC is on defense. Yeah, with those second-chance points, there's a lot of kickouts to open threes, which helps the other teams' percentages go up and shoot, score at a more efficient rate. Like you said, with the rebounding issue, with Nicola, Benny, and Shemezi, they're obviously good as a trio, but they aren't the dominant presence that Pirtle is on the inside. And as we showed you, USC's defense has struggled in recent weeks, but also on Sunday in particular. Head coach Andy Enfield explained why Pirtle is so tough to defend. Well, you try to keep the ball out of his hands as best you can, and once he touches it, and then we tried to double team him, and he was able to find some shooters, he got a few threes, and, and then when we, we didn't double him, he scored on us, uh, and then he, he, he had six offensive rebounds, so you try to block him out, and, but he's very, a very smart player, and he, and he um, uh, was uh, extremely effective. Now let's break down a couple plays about why Pirtle has been so effective. Let's roll the first one. Pirtle gets really deep position on the inside, and when he catches the ball, he's almost in the restricted area already. Way too easy for an easy layup. Yeah. All right, Paolo, so we saw the first play. Now break down what specifically happened to me in this free throw. Okay, there's a few things that went wrong here. There's, first of all, the biggest problem was that uh, Shemezi Metsu let Jacob Pirtle get in way too deep in, inside of his zone right here. If he's already so close to the basket, his bucket, his hook, or whatever he's going to do to score is going to be way too easy. And you can see everybody's out at the perimeter and only Poto's inside. And you see Keenan Ryan out here, he's lost track of his man. But if he's going to even lose track of his perimeter guy, he's got to come in and help earlier here to deny the ball to Poto. Because if not, then he's going to have the easy score like we saw. Absolutely. And the next, in the next picture here, Poto's got that inside position. And what happens here? Exactly. So he's already caught the ball high, which means, you know, he's ready to go. He's ready to turn up and face up or whatever he needs to do to get that bucket. You see, Shemezi here, he's lo he doesn't have the, the power. Right? He, he, he's lost his base, and Poto's just going to do an easy turnaround and really score. And Caden's already, you know, he's too late. Poto's already have the ball. He has not denied it, and it's just going to be way too easy. Absolutely. Let's watch it again. As you can see, Poto gets the ball way too deep. Caden doesn't come over to help, and it's an easy layup. All right, so obviously that was a catch where Poto got too deep. Let's check out our next play. This time, Pirtle doesn't get quite as deep position. The double team comes from Benny this time, and Pirtle's able to kick it across the court for a wide open three. So this play, obviously, Paolo, was a little bit different than last time. What did USC do differently, and how did Pirtle exploit it? Right. So I think USC really quickly realized they needed a double team Pirtle because otherwise he was just going to dominate down low. So in this play, you see uh, Benny Borrell starts shading over to where Pirtle is, and the perimeter shooters are all lined up around. You see the screen right here, which means this guy's going to get open. He's already wide open. But... When Benny comes down here, you're going to see in the, next, in the next slide how that really creates a problem because everybody has to rotate, and they didn't do it quickly enough. Let's check it out. Right, so you see Benny's already here, and not just Benny shading over to Portal, but you see Julian Jacobs' eyes are already turned that way too, so it's almost like a triple team. Uh, and like I said over there, the guy is wide open here, so he, Portal has so many decisions. He can go right here to this guy who's also wide open, or he can kick it out to this guy who's also wide open. Yeah, the problem here is the rotation, which is actually a good scheme by USC to not allow, because when Benny's coming over to double team, his man's going to be wide open. But because right. Julian sucks down, that leaves his man wide open on the perimeter. As yeah, and see. this is a mismatch as well. 
So in this one, the, the catch obviously wide open as Jordan had to come down and Pirtle and with the cross court And everybody has to pass. rush back everybody out, but it's over. way too late. The open shot, it's going to go in. Let's roll it one more time. Uh, as you can see, Pirtle gets the ball. The double, almost a triple team comes over. Pirtle finds the wide open man on the cross court pass with an easy knockdown through. For our third play, we're going to break down how USD was able to double Pirtle successfully and how they need to do that going forward if they face an elite big man. So Pirtle finds position in the middle of the floor, gets fed the ball, but the double team comes from the top this time from Malik Martin who gets the easy steal. Obviously in this play we saw how USC was successfully able to execute a double team as Malik Martin came down for the easy steal. Paolo, let's break it down. Alright, so first off, things are entirely different here. Jacob Pirtle already has the ball, but Shemezi Mehta has position on him. He's yeah, pushing Pirtle's him out. not as deep in the paint like exactly. he was Exactly, he's pushing him out. And not just that, he's getting physical with him, he's making him uncomfortable. And Jordan McLaughlin and Malik Martin, their eyes are set on the ball here. Yeah, what, what's great here, the helpful for USC is that Utah's other big man is at the top of the key, so when the double team comes from there, if Pirtle wants to kick it out to the open guy, it's a big man, he's not as good of a shooter, exactly. you'll live with that play, so that's why you double him down, and then Malik Martin's able to come down for the easy steal, let's check it out one more time. So obviously... USC has a lot of issues with their interior defense. They were able to figure out some of them. But they have a big weekend coming up up in the Bay against Stanford and Cal. Paolo, what's your prediction about how USC is going to do this week? Really big games. I think Stanford game is, will be easy for the Trojans. They should be able to win it even though they have had some road woes. But the bigger game is on Sunday when they face Cal. Cal is in fourth place in the Pac-12 right now and USC is in fifth. So that battle for the fourth seed, you know, the top four seeds in the, in the Pac-12 end up getting the buy for the tournament. So that's going to be a huge game. I think USC... I think they'll beat Stanford. I think they'll struggle against Cal and they'll drop a close one. One and one that's better than they'll have done on their previous two road trips. Obviously, they need to step up their interior defense this weekend as Cal has a pro-ready big man as well in Ivan Rab. But that's all the time Paolo and I have. The Trojans play on Thursday at 8 p.m. against Stanford before Sunday at 4 against Cal. Now let's go to Alexa, who caught up with the USC men's volleyball player. Hey guys, I'm Alexa Palermo, and this is Ask an Athlete. This week, we're here with Woody Cook, freshman for the men's volleyball team. So, in 60 seconds, I'm going to ask you as many questions as I possibly can. You ready? Right, let's do it. Okay, here we go. So, favorite food? Uh, pizza. Favorite movie? Step Brothers. Biggest pet peeve? Um, chewing with your mouth open. Favorite song? Um, ooh, um, What's it called? All right, uh, let's do uh, The Ocean by Led Zeppelin. Zodiac sign? I don't know what that means. <laughs> That's okay. Dream vacation? Hawaii. Uh, biggest fear? Uh, heights. Least favorite food? Uh, green peas. Nice. Most embarrassing moment? Um, getting pants in third grade. <laughs> Celebrity crush? Uh, Mila Kunis. Favorite place? Favorite place? USC. Favorite TV show? Um, Breaking Bad. Happiest moment? Um, first game at USC. And something we might not know about you? Um, I can juggle. Awesome. Well, that's all I have for this week. Check back next week for more of your favorite athletes. The USC track and field team is finishing up their indoor season and is ready for the postseason. The MPSF championships take place in Seattle on Friday and Saturday of this week before the NCAA championships in early March. Cindy Robinson and Scott Cook have more. Hey Trojan fans, I'm Cindy Robinson. And I'm Scott Cook. Now a lot of people don't realize it, but track and field has officially started their season. It's indoor time. That's right, Cindy. The USC Trojans have been competing all winter long in their indoor season, and this coming weekend, they're heading up to the University of Washington for their MPSF Conference Championship. Now, we caught up with one of the captains and the head coach to give us a little insight about what they expect this weekend. It's going pretty good as a team. Uh, I got injured pretty early, so I'm just trying to get back out here and get in shape, get ready for outdoors. Yeah, we should definitely be able to sweep the 400. Uh, I don't know who's doing the 200, so, but if we did, if we were in the 200, we'll sweep that definitely. Uh, 60, look out for Adore Jackson and Dom. You should expect us to all qualify, uh, make a statement, and then hopefully transition to outdoors pretty well. Cindy, we heard Justin shout out some of his teammates who he, you know, thinks are going to perform well this weekend. You caught up with Coach Smith Gilbert. What did she have to say about the team? She actually had high expectations for the team overall. I think we'll perform well. Uh, you got a lot of high-level teams at, at MPSF. I think I heard every Pac-12 school is now going to be at the MPSF, which may be a first. So that will be very competitive, be a lot of fun. 
Um, the track is, is fast. They do a great job at Washington of, of putting on the meet. So I, I, I think that we'll do well. What we're trying to do is go in and put everybody in a position to do well at nationals or whether it's speed work or taking it as another step. Some people are going for a workout or a tune-up for nationals. Some people are going to get qualified for nationals. And some people are going to compete and learn what it's like to participate at a Pac-12 outdoor championship. Usual names should, should, should pop up. Uh, I don't like to say because <laughs> I don't want to put any limits on anybody. So I guess maybe the name you should look for would be just USC. Trojan fans, keep your eyes out for triple jumper Eric Sloan. He already has the nation's leading mark in the triple jump this indoor season. We can definitely expect some great marks and great times from this team. We'll look forward to see the results. For USC Annenberg Media, I'm Cindy Robinson. And I'm Scott Cook. There's been lots of Trojan action on the field, on the court, and in the pool. And there's always action on Instagram. Let's take a look at the photos that are creating the most buzz this week. President Nikias Instagrammed a photo on Sunday night's basketball game against Utah with his wife Nikki and the namesake of our building, Wallace Annenberg, saying, quote, We're all cheering on the Trojans at today's USC vs. Utah basketball game. Go Trojans! Two weeks ago, Zach Banner posted a video with his fellow Trojans and a signed football for Sergeant Oliver Campbell, a Trojan fan and soldier who was wounded while serving in the Army. Yesterday, Zach posted a photo that said, quote, my man, Ollie C93, is healthy and received the football I sent him with signatures on it. I am always honored to help people, especially those who protect our country. Way to go, Zach. Special thanks to Sergeant Campbell for serving our country. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Elijah Stewart. Elijah Instagrammed this shot on Sunday after the Utah game, saying, this honestly sums up my life. I don't even know what happened here. Even better is the post that immediately followed. We don't know what happened here, Elijah, but we like it. I heard the swim team is holding open tryouts. Here's a hoping Elijah can get us an out of the water and dry off for Thursday's game against Stanford. Jackson, back to you. Thanks, Hannah. Max, one thing that really stuck out to me from that social media segment was President Nikias' wife is named Nikki, so she married into the name Nikki Nikias. I mean, I'm amazed. Uh, the thing I like about it, though, is you're never, ever going to forget that name. So probably a good thing for her. Nikki Nikias, yeah. shout out to you. Shout out. But USC football news never stops either. And we here at Sports Scene send our congratulations to freshman long snapper Jake Olson. Olson's the eighth winner of the Uplifting Athletes Rare Disease Champion Award. Olson beat out five other finalists in the two-week long vote. And for those who don't know, Jake was born with retinoblastoma, the cancer of the eyes. He lost his left eye when he was 10 months old and completely lost vision at the age of 12. Former USC head coach Pete Carroll named him an honorary member of the team back in 2009, and Olsen joined the team officially this past season. Well, he's never gotten any game action, Olsen is an inspiration to his teammates on and off the field. I would say that he's probably the only person left on the team from the Pete Carroll era that we would like to still have there. I'm going to agree with you on that one. One thing that I like is that one of the five players that Olsen beat out for the award is UCLA cornerback Marcus Rios. Props to Marcus, he overcame a, fa a rare fungal infection, had a game-winning interception against Cal. But it's always good to see Trojans beating out some Bruins. And fighting on, always. Always. And that's all we have for the show this week, but be sure to tune in next Tuesday when we see if the Trojans can bounce back from their home loss and pick up some important road victories in the Bay Area. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at SportsCNUSC, like us on Facebook, and check out the new website, USCNBergMedia.com. See you next week.